Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another episode of Friday Morning at the Fun House alongside the man himself, Mr. Martin Popoff. Martin, I never know what yes. side you're going to be on. Right now, you're up yeah. here, but when the time is the show, time, there's that reverse mirror thing going. You don't know why you got it. Sometimes it's proper. I don't know, I don't know what's going on, but yeah, <laughs> morning, morning on this uh, absolutely rainy and even flooding day in Toronto. Same here. Uh, we we went from brutal cold for oh, like a week and a half, and then we got snow. The snow melted. It got warmer. We got lots of rain. We've had lots of rain. Froze up again. Now we've had rain again. I, once again, I'm, I'm I got all this water on top of my pool cover. I got to siphon that off today. I feel like that's all I've been doing. And the ground is like total mush. There's been fog, and now it's going to get cold again. It's interesting. They originally called early this week. It was going to be almost sixty today here in the Hudson Valley in New York, and. And then yesterday they totally changed that. Now it's barely going to be 40. Yeah. yeah. How, how is there a 20 degree shift in temperature? Like how in your prediction, know. how does that happen? I don't, um, it's not like five degrees, right? We're talking 20. How does that happen? Yeah. I don't know, man. I'm, I'm just worried about fire season. I mean, I hope this isn't the year that, that it, it just all of Canada and America burns down. Right. Because last year was 10 times higher than the highest year for forest fires in Canada. 10 times so man yeah there's just not been enough snow anywhere this year so far all this did you did you guys get a lot of rain like over the summer because i know we got a lot of rain here this year yeah i think so i i I know people were complaining it was overcast all the time at least yeah i mean it's better that than no than dry right because then the dry just totally leads into the fires and stuff even easier so yeah it's yeah that's crazy I just feel like the government, both governments should have been like literally treating this entire winter like uh, an, an emergency and getting ready for the summer because who knows, man. This You, you can't wait for the last minute, right? Yeah, yeah. This could be the year. This could be the year where the biggest environmental hazard is forest fires, right? Yeah. I, don't know. yeah. I hope not for our yeah. sake. I hope not. So we'll see. All right. So we got a fun uh, episode for you here today. Something a little bit different here. As you can see by the title of the video, why don't you sing your own lyrics? That is the question we uh, pondered here. It's like, well, isn't it weird how you have these very notable singers fronting these very notable bands and they don't write any of their own songs. They just go up there year after year, tour after tour, album after album and sing what someone else has presented them, whether it's the guitar player, the drummer, the keyboard player, whatever it might be. And this goes on for year after year after year after year. And they don't seem to care too much about it. Sometimes we care though. That's why we're doing this show because maybe we care a little bit or maybe we've thought about it and like, exactly. why is this? So we've each picked out, instead of doing the normal five, we've each picked out six because we want to give you guys a little bit more. Uh, singers in notable bands who barely write jack shit. Maybe they don't write at all. Uh, and we'll kind of talk a little bit about m- why that might be. And then, and Martin and I just decided to do this yesterday. We're going to give you kind of like a scoring system on how that affects, how this has affected our viewpoint on the singer and the band in general. Do we care at all? Has it just worked out fine? Or is our perception that, Jesus, I really wish this guy wrote more because maybe it would increase my love for this band or offer some more variety or something like that. So one so we're going to do a score of one to ten one being it's absolutely fine we don't care and ten being like this really this has bugged me all these years that the fact that this person has not written lyrics for this band right so does that kind of describe a good martin i think yeah I that's perfect i and i love this topic i think it's great so uh well I'll, I'll just dive into the first one but yeah all all of those uh all of those uh you know contours will come out as as we go here so uh my first example here is a band I've never talked about here on Sea of Tranquility Rush. <laughs> uh, you know, and I and I'm joking, of course. But what I what I love about this topic is uh, I was thinking of all the Rush shows I've done on the Contrarians and with Ryan and Rush fans and everywhere and writing the Rush books and stuff. I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about this topic, right? Uh, Like specifically think about how much does this bother me sort of thing. And, uh, and so, yeah, I'm I'm about to say something I've really never talked about before uh, about, about this band. So um, how much does this bother me? So, so the interesting thing with, uh, with this band in particular, so I think what you have, you have obviously um, the drummer of the band writing all the lyrics and what we've grown to love immediately, essentially when it started is 
it's just uh, this uh, this interesting feature of the band, and we're and we're happy about it, kind of thing. I, I don't think anywhere along the way we've we've looked down upon Getty Lee for not writing his own lyrics because of a, a, a few factors. Number one, I think, which is really interesting, is you might have thought that way as a kid or a new fan, we were all new fans of, of Rush in, in 74, 75, 76, or any fans that were around were new fans. So you might've thought that way early on where you go, who is this airhead singing these, these words? Why can't he write his own lyrics? Right. But I don't, I don't recall that ever happening. Um, and maybe early on, uh, you know, given that we don't have the internet in 1976, uh, you know, you have to read the credits and really care to, to know these sorts of things. But as time goes on, I think what happens is as it, as it becomes sort of common knowledge and the records build up and everything. And importantly, as Getty becomes a Renaissance man and a learned man and has lots of hobbies and you know, he's the leader of the band. Um, and, and so as life goes on, you think, no, I don't. We don't have to worry about Getty. He's not an airhead. He's actually really smart. He's a super smart guy. He's running this band. He's got all these different cool hobbies he's into. He's he's learned and traveled and he knows a lot about baseball and bass guitars and wine and all this stuff. Right. So that's one thing. The other thing is, which I touched upon, he's the leader. So you respect him because he's kind of the leader. Right. He's kind of the guy who's closest to a manager of the three guys. Right in the band also um they they you know this is a trio so there's there's only three of them there and um and so they all have a lot of work but also what getty does is he happens to be a pretty important uh bass player right and he also happens to um we we learn over time that with rush essentially getty and alex write the music and i i really think getty has almost a bigger hand in the music than alex so you respect him for that as well he's a big music writer um and then the final thing I want to mention is, well, two things. We know that Getty um, works with Neil on the lyrics and changes things here and there. But the other big thing is across all these super interesting lyrics that we get out of this drummer. So we're celebrating this drummer, right? That he's doing this. It's, it's, a, it's an uncommon thing to have happen. And he's a really good lyricist. And, and there's a lot of depth and density to what he does. What we also learn over time is that um, Getty... Well, number one, he doesn't want to sing anything that he doesn't feel comfortable with, uh, you know, feeling uh, is part of his own complex life philosophy. But number two, uh, just naturally what Neil writes is the same as Getty's complex life philosophy and all the stuff about being kind of like atheists and, and uh, interested in a lot of a lot of different things and, and the travel stuff. So so what we have here is two guys that are that are both super interesting guys and they happen to think sort of the same. So when Getty's singing these words, um, it seems really comfortable and you feel like there's an element of they are Getty approved. Right. Um, and I just wanted to, to compare just one thing. Um, it's funny. I thought about, uh, you're not talking about thin Lizzy or rainbow at all. Right. Well, yeah, cause obviously um, yeah, they, they actually don't fit the concept, but in terms of, in terms of like comparing, I think like, with Thin Lizzy, it's funny. You've got a bass player singing and he's singing music he wrote and lyrics he wrote. And it's almost too much. It's it's like he's he's got so much of the responsibility on him. Right. So Rush has this kind of cool thing where they got these three guys making this super complex music and lyrics and they and they, you know, by necessity, almost have to split it up. And and another funny one is is Rainbow, where where it's like so. Ronnie's up there singing his lyrics or Joe Lynn Turner's up there singing his lyrics and the look on Richie's face the whole time, right. As they're doing their thing, right. Live. It's almost like, um, it's almost like, um, what he's, what he's telling you is, uh, the views expressed in these songs are not the views of, of the leader of the band in a way. Right. It's like, these guys are separate to me. So there's, there's a separate. He allows that you, to happen. He is. Allowed yeah. Yeah. Happen. And you don't get, you almost get it. You get the feeling like having lyrics is a nuisance to him. And, and these things are saying, you know, in his head, he's rolling his eyes about whatever they're talking about sort of thing, but with rush. So the comparison is, is like, 
when Getty's say, singing these things, you you really feel like he believes most of it too, and he finds most of it interesting. And um, you know, he he probably helped Neil in in some way with with coming together with them. And he's like he's like putting his polish of approval on him. But with Rainbow, you just think, you know. What what would Richie think if he he was writing the lyrics? What does he have to say? You're watching him and you're daydreaming, going, "I wonder what Richie would talk about if he ha- if he had his druthers, right?" Um, so so yeah, it, it's funny. Richie's you, you look at him and go, "Maybe you're kind of an airhead for not writing any lyrics." Like it, it's like ah, maybe you're kind of stupider than we thought, right? Uh, you know, <laughs> why don't you want to write more lyrics, for example? Right. Or, yeah. So that's that's a thing you think. So uh, I'll stop there. That's so that's. I mean, that, that's I mean, that's a that's like a whole other show right there. You know, I mean, I love Blackmore to death, but, you know, he wanted to leave purple to go and do something different. And and what he said was he that whole idea of those first couple of Rainbow albums is exactly where he would have wanted purple to go. So let me leave the band and go do that. He brings in a guy who's a really strong lyricist who could do exactly what he wanted. And then he tired of that. Right. Richie was kind of, ah, you know, singing about, you know, all the rainbows and dragons and, you know, yeah. princes and kings and all this kind of stuff. Ah, I've lost interest in this. They bring in Graham Bronnett, who early on, obviously, had no interest in writing lyrics. So he's got Roger, I guess. I don't know. Did Richie write any lyrics on Down to Earth? I know Roger had a good hand yeah. in that. Maybe I don't, I'm not really sure how that, yeah. how that worked. And then he brings in Joel and Turner, right? Because he wants someone who can bring him in this kind of foreigner type direction. He wants to be more commercial and he wants to compete with some of these melodic rock bands. And then, like you said, you could tell like very early on, he's already tired of that already and writing these song love songs and things like that. So it's like, you know, Richie, what do you want to do? But he never obviously sat down and said, I'm going to try my hand at writing lyrics. It just doesn't make any sense when you think about it. But then again, knowing Richie Blackmore, like we all do over these years, is it really all that surprising? Not really. Yeah. I don't think I don't think Richie is ever happy doing anything for too long. Yeah. And 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 you know, those thoughts only cross your mind or more so will cross your mind if that guitarist or bass player or whatever is the leader of the band. And you know, in this case, it was actually originally called Richie Blackmore's Rainbow Even, right? So you may not think that as as we go in some of these examples, you know, that that might that might come to fruition. But uh, anyways, what's your first example? Yeah. My first pick is uh, Bob Catley from Magnum. Mm-hmm. So, you know, here's a guy, he's the sound of Magnum. Uh, great voice, very unique voice. He's been the singer since day one, right? So obviously Kingdom of Madness, their first album in 1978. And across 46 years and 23 studio albums leading up to the brand new one, Here Comes the Rain, Tony Clarkin, the guitar player, has written every lyric, every ounce of music all throughout the catalog up until he passed away just a couple weeks ago, right? So obviously that comes to an abrupt end. Uh, Here's the thing. Uh, Magnum has a signature sound. Really, you know, they're one of these bands that like, as soon as you hear them, you know them. That's partly due to Bob's voice. Like I said, it's very unique, very melodic voice, but it's just, he's got a certain timbre to his voice that like, you know, it's Magnum as soon as you hear him. Uh, But the Magnum sound is also quite unique. It's like this kind of weird formula. Is it hard rock? Is it prog? Is it AOR? Is it pomp? It's melodic, right? It's like kind of like all that stuff rolled into one. And The driving factor, the driving force behind that signature sound for all these years and all the albums has always been Bob Catley. I mean, uh, 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 Tony Clarkin. What's interesting is that Bob has done a good amount of solo albums over the years. But what does he do in his solo albums? He basically hooks up with a guy, Gary Hughes, who's the leader and chief songwriter and lyricist of the band 10, And he does these solo albums and Gary writes all the lyrics and the music. So it's like, so the great Bob Catley, who we all love, we love his voice. He has shown throughout his career that he's just not interested in being that guy. He's like, I'll leave writing songs up to other people. I will just show up and work my magic. So I guess it works for him. And honestly, you know, I've been a fan of Magnum for a long time, but I never really thought about this all too much. You know what? I really started thinking about this, Martin, over the last couple of weeks, because since Tony passed away, everybody's now saying, well, what's going to be the future of Magnum? And when you go back and look at it, 
there is no future of Magnum. Because who's going to write the songs? Nobody in the band, specifically not Bob Catley, has ever tried to do that. And it's almost like now we feel like, well, we love this band so much. Why didn't Bob step up at some point during their long career to, to kind of try his hand at writing lyrics? Because maybe they could piece together the band and continue onwards. But it's very obvious and very realistic to think that Magnum is pretty much done at this point, which is very sad um because bob is just not that guy he is very content to take whatever tony has given him over the years the melodies the words everything and just kind of take it and run with it so for me uh, we we got we got to we probably should do the ranking thing on this i'm going to give yes. this a one i'm totally fine with this i think that uh bob just hasn't shown that he's that guy throughout his career and he has managed to do great things with really good lyricists. And, you know, it's really funny is we're doing the show and I always claim about how I'm not a lyrics guy. Right. But I think a lot of the bands we're going to talk about today, I can make an exception for, because I've always kind of like taken an eye for what they've done. And for, you know, some of these are bands that like, you know, I can kind of dig with the lyrics at least. So yeah, for me, I'm giving this a one. I'm totally fine with the fact that Bob never wrote anything, not a lick for this band. I think the formula and history shows that it really worked out. Uh, for the band in this fashion you had one guy none of their albums 23 albums none of them really sound all that drastically different from any of the others there's a formula there the formula works unique sounding band i'm okay with it so bob catley writing nothing for magnum tony gets all the credit and i'm okay with it okay uh i'm gonna go a seven on this one um or no i'll go a six on this one uh it's it's it looks bad on Bob, but the the band is fine, right? So I'm gonna go on Rush. I'm gonna go two. So it bothers me only a tiny, tiny bit. What is your rating on Rush? Uh, I'm also gonna go with a two. And you know, I I kind of see where you're coming from on Bob Catley because maybe uh, there's a predictability in the Magnum catalog because Tony was the driving force mm -hmm. there. And maybe you know, are we really? looking at magnum lyrics as being these magnificent works of art like a lot of the rush mm -hmm. songs and lyrics maybe not right to me magnum is all about the overall picture it all sounds great it's all nice and lush and melodic and you know we really emotional all that kind of stuff whereas rush i think is a different story neil was writing these little mini stories these complicated sci-fi things i think that really appeal to a different audience when it comes to lyric appreciation so yeah with rush i'm totally okay with it because i think that formula really worked and neil was obviously the guy that wrote lyrics which i think worked for a band like rush uh maybe the one thing we could say about bob and magnum is that maybe we would have gotten a little bit more variety in their music had bob contributed some lyrics i don't know it's kind of too late to yeah and, and the ridiculous thing of course is that as the voice of the band uh he's so much of a stamp on the band if you don't know the backstory kind of thing such that um him and gary could probably do a magnum album and if you were wily about it you wouldn't even sort of notice the the, the particular difference i mean this band could carry on you know i, I mean uh, if if the fans accept it i mean they they may revolt but um, but essentially, because we're just talking songwriting and guitars and stuff that can all be fixed on a computer or written in a perfect, perfect, perfect way, um, the voice is so important. Right. So, they well, I mean, that's that's an amazing point. And I'll tell you why I think it is, because if you, you know, I, I mentioned earlier how Magnum is this very unique sounding band. If there's any other band out there that maybe is doing something somewhat similar, it's the band 10. They've got, I mean, that's, that's the plain truth. I mean, you, you look, you listen to the 10 catalog and it's eerily similar to that of Magnum and that most of their albums have a very specific formula. It's got AOR, it's got melodic rock, it's got, it's hard rock, it's prog, it's all these things. And you've got the signature voice, you got the signature guy writing everything. So is it all that surprising when Bob decided to go solo that he pulls Gary in to basically write everything for him so i never even thought about that martin if what could magnum carry on with gary hughes now being the guy in yeah. place of tony clarkin yeah. do we really need 10 when we got magnum right do we need both bands why not just kind of combine i don't know yeah. 
And I'm sure Mag- longtime Magnum fans are probably like, no, we can't do that. Got to let the band go. Now that Tony's gone and I get all that, but I'm just saying, what if, could it work? I think so. Yeah. yeah. You know who else could write for Magnum? Tommy Shaw, Kelly Keeling, Jack Blades, Michael Sadler, you know, yeah. all, all these guys could do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty interesting. All right. So my next choice is uh, Max Webster. Um, so uh, another Canadian band and actually the baby rush. Um, but yeah, this is a weird situation where you have an outside lyricist, a guy who's not even an instrument player in the great Pai Dubois. Um, I love his lyrics. He's one of my three favorite lyricists of all time. Um, so this is just this, uh, again, it's a, it's a really neat feature kind of like rush where you had the drummer. Now you've got a guy who's like this, um, this cool poet, uh, this, this sort of like, um, uh, you know, uh, multi-sense sort of childlike naive hippie uh optimistic sunny um psychedelic uh sort of lyrics um and uh and and he's just he's just really well he he's not he's not precise and diamond like but the neat thing is when he works with kim mitchell kim really has to edit and move things around and make it into a song you know pie's stream of conscious poetry which could be lots of lines or just even one line uh and then he's blinking it's up to that and then so so it's chaos at the beginning but it becomes these lyrics um so uh, so it's an interesting thing. And what you get is these great lyrics and uh, and nobody's sort of hiding the fact. And I think people kind of know that they've got this uh, this wise Swami sitting up on a mountain, you know, with this big, uh, big bushy mustache uh, looking like Jerry Garcia writing these lyrics. And then the other thing is you've got uh, an interesting dynamic where you've got the very talented Terry Watkinson, who's the keyboardist of the band, who's usually writing his own lyrics. Um, so you got you get a little bit of that mixed in as well. Um but, uh, you know, this is this is a situation where um, it, it doesn't really bother me a lot. But as usual, it's going to look a little bit banned on uh, or bad on on the guitarist, on Kim Mitchell, because, again, just like we talked about with uh, with um, uh, Richie Blackmore, for example, it's like you're wondering, well, why don't you want to say anything or why don't you want to write lyrics? But but I think you you um, this is this is almost like. Uh, the, the the smartness and savvy and strategy of knowing we've got this treasure, this buddy of mine that I grew up with, who's this great lyricist, and we want our stuff to be really literary. And he's realizing how strong the lyrics are if he does them with pie. And then, like I say, he has to do a lot of editing, just just the same way Neil's told me, just the same way I'm going through when I'm trying to, you know, I want to eventually get a get a um a book of pie's lyrics out so he keeps sending me stuff all the time and and i have to edit stuff and move around and i warn him like look i have to do a lot of fixing of this to get it from the scribbles on the page into the computer right into yeah. something that is is halfway readable and and soon as that you know as soon as i started that process i i realized the light bulb went off and everything kim said so so and neil said um about you know things like tom sawyer so yeah i think this is a this is a great situation I've read in the comments, people want me to stop saying so, so often. I got to, I got to stop doing that. Right. (laughs) Um, But uh, I think this is a situation where um, it's just a really interesting, cool feature of the band. It's uh, it's in the tradition of John Barlow and Robert Hunter with Grateful Dead and, and Pete Brown in, in cream. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's kind of a cool thing when you see this, it's rare, uh, but it is interesting. Um, Max Webster, my second example. Oh, I'm going to give that. Um, I'm going to give that a, yeah. So, so my notes here say a two, but a five on Kim. Right. So it bothers me a little bit for the one guy, you know, you're, you're looking at and being, you know, I want to hear what you think. Right. Um, but it doesn't bother me for the overall band very much at all. Yeah. I would agree with that. I was, I would give it a four because I, I saw, always wondered if, what, did Kim want to be more involved on that front? And then, you know, I, the band kind of fizzled fairly early into their in their career and he went solo immediately so you have to wonder if he really wanted to do that i don't know but the formula worked so you really can't complain but yeah you kind of you almost wanted kim to have a little bit more of a hand in it but so yeah all right uh you, you hinted at some good things there that i'm gonna as far as having the outside writer guy because i'm gonna that's coming up in a little bit on one of my other picks and that's a really fascinating thing but we're gonna move on next to uh, roger daltrey and the who 
So almost from day one, not quite, you know, early on in the band's career, you had Roger wrote a little, Pete wrote the most, uh, John wrote a little, Keith occasionally would write, but it was really with, uh, you know, it really, really started with Tommy, where all of a sudden Pete Townsend became the, the dominant force in the band that he would be for the rest of their career. And, you know, when you really think about it through albums like Tommy and Who's Next and Quadrophenia and really any of the others, you've got a very dominant force there, someone who is feeling the pulse of the fan base and the the youth of the world at the time and uh any any you know roger kind of checked out as far as wanting to write anything fairly early on even before tommy and i think with the tommy album he must have somehow came to this decision that what i'm going to do is i'm going to immerse myself in pete's lyrics and these characters and these stories. And I'm going to be that guy that's going to bring them in life on stage, bring them to life on stage. And that's my contribution to the band. And you could really see him if you watched a lot of the live Who clips from 1969, 70, and 71. You can see Roger becoming that guy. He's like, I'm going to take Pete's lyrics and bring them to life. I'm going to act out, you know, by acting out uh, the deaf, dumb, and blind kid and Tommy and onwards, he became that guy. So what's interesting, though, is like when you hear, you know, obviously John wanted to write more. John was a writer. He did a lot of solo albums and he generally you would have at least one Entwistle track on each of the albums going forward. But to me, the Entwistle songs always kind of stood out like they didn't really fit. They're good, but they don't really fit. Um, but what's I think fascinating is that you would assume that over the years, especially when Pete started to have issues with writer's block, probably starting with Who by Numbers and going forward, certainly on uh, Who Are You and even the post Keith Moon albums. You know, Pete, if you read his books, has often talked about how he was really having a hard time coming up with things that are on the, you know, because after this stuff, he wanted every album to be this grand, big, you know, concept album and have have meaning and he was having issues with that you know maybe based on a lot of things going on in his life so you know when roger starts going out and doing solo records he doesn't write a damn thing on these either and not it's not like the uh the bob catley thing where he goes and grabs a gary hughes right or go a pi dubois or whatever it's got a million people writing on these these are all covers and uh russ ballard songs and this guy's songs and that guy's songs and it's just like does he have no interest and you know over the years you read a lot about how sometimes roger and pete would kind of be at odds because roger was having a hard time grasping these ideas and these characters and things that uh pete was trying to convey in his lyrics and you have to wonder and i know martin i know you're a big fan of these albums and i'm, I'm not quite but you know it's hard and you know the the two albums they did after keith moon passed away to me seemed like pete was struggling with coming up with ideas and i'm just i'm i've always wondered why didn't roger maybe try to step up and give his hand at contributing lyrics and bringing ideas to the table. Again, maybe he just, he's not that guy and he's not capable. The solo albums tell me that he's not that guy and he never wanted to be that guy. But uh, I always got the impression that, you know, John could step up whenever. Uh, and I always had the feeling that Pete wanted to keep John's writing at bay a little bit. Uh, but Roger certainly never did that. So for me, <clears throat> I'm going to I'm going to give this a five because I always thought that especially when Pete was not at his peak writing form, that maybe some contributions from Roger might have added a little something extra to some of these who albums that maybe these days we think are a little on the weaker side. I don't know. But I, I just to me, he always seemed like that guy that could have been this person if it's something he really wanted to. I'm gathering he just didn't want to. And he's like, we got a guy who does that. I'm just going to bring his lyrics to life. That's my role in the who. Yeah. All right. I'm, I'll give this one an eight because this one always really bothered me. Uh, you know, number number two or number one, wherever we are in the points, I would say that uh, Pete Pete's actually my favorite singer in the band too. And Roger's not playing an instrument either. A little bit of acoustic guitar here or, or guitar here and there, whatever. Um, but it, it did really always bother me. Um, it's like, 
when Pete's singing these lyrics, it just feels like personal. It's someone bearing, bearing his soul when Roger's singing them, you know, I hate to use the word airhead, but, um, but you know, empty suit or whatever, whatever you want an empty vessel. When Roger's singing these lyrics, I'm very cognizant that Pete's written this stuff. Right. And it's distracting to me. It bothers me. Right. And then, and then the, you know, what we see on the solo albums. Yeah. It's, it's too bad. Right. And sometimes I, you know, I get a little angry and think, you know, um, you, you had all those years. This is your job. You're the lead singer. Um, you know, this is something you could do to make yourself a more substantial, fuller, fuller spectrum kind of rock star. And it's not there. So I'm going to give this one a, an eight. Um, so basically, so should... you basically what you're saying is his interpretations just don't come across as honest. And I totally get that. Yeah, yeah, it bothers me. And I don't even care about the idea of interpreting. And I'm the actor of these things. And, and you know, Pete Pete actually even vocalizes or or, uh, or frames that uh, even more eloquently than Roger does. Like, like Pete pumps up what Roger's role is. He does a better job of explaining it and making it sound valid than Roger even does. Because uh, Pete's such a great speaker, period, right? He's like, yeah, a great he speaker, really is. Right? So, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. I'm going to pick it up a little bit because I don't want to keep you all day. We got a lot to get through uh, still. So Iron Maiden is my next choice. And uh, this is the category of, of partially. Um, so we've got Bruce Dickinson, just to keep things simple here. Um, you know, Bruce wrote nothing on number of the beast. He wrote four on Peace of Mind, uh, none on Somewhere in Time, four on Seventh Son, three on Senjutsu, four on Book of Souls before that. So what you have here, uh, I've got to stop the show. So uh, the, the idea here is that um, we have a guy that's proven he's a, he's a great lyricist, and he totally is, and he's really proven it uh, across the solo canon, and he's a very talented, he's writing a lot of the music too, just interviewed him for the new album. Um, the new album is a masterpiece, it's so good. Um, but you know, he's proven himself to be incredibly, incredibly talented period. So I have no problems with, uh, Bruce, uh, not writing, uh, all of the lyrics sort of thing. Steve Harris writes slightly more lyrics than Bruce does, and they're fine and they're great as well. And we know Steve Harris is the leader of the band. We like the idea that he's the bass player as well. So it's interesting that we have the bass player writing a lot of these lyrics. Um, and then the last thing I want to say in is in comparison to Rush, but even more so, it's actually hard to even tell apart their lyrics between Steve and Bruce because they love all the same topics and subjects and, and the war stuff and the movie stuff and all that sort of thing, um, the battles. Um, you know, a little bit of the occult or whatever, or the paranormal, whatever you want to call it. Um, so that's really an interesting thing about this as well, is that they their minds work so much alike. And I guess the other main reason that that's really, uh, you know, suitable in this case is that their minds are so much alike. They love kind of all the same sort of hobbies and topics that when Bruce is even singing Steve's songs, it totally sounds like Bruce wrote it anyways. Right. And and vice versa. I mean, Steve's lyrics could uh, Bruce's lyrics could sound like Steve wrote them. Uh, so so that's kind of a. Um, my feeling with Maiden, it's never bothered me at all because he's just a proven guy, you know, put aside the the fencing and the flying planes. And of course, like I say, the solo cannon, which is, which is really good. Um, so I have no problem with this one at all whatsoever. I'm going to give it a, give it a one on the bothersome level. Yeah. I'm kind of with you there. I, I, maybe I'll give it a two, but, uh, I, I think the only, you know, back in the day in the eighties, when they were releasing all those legendary albums, I don't think any of us really cared all that much about it. The formula was winning and, you know, whatever Steve was writing was, was turning into gold. Right. I think where we look at this a little more closely is in more recent times, like over the last 20 years, when you've got all these latter period maiden albums, which, you know, uh, have been controversial. You know, there's a lot of bloat there, a lot of repeat of themes and things like that. And even though Bruce has done a fair amount of the writing, you, you look at Bruce's solo albums and, you know, so many of us look at those so fondly and think that, you know, maybe Steve should lighten up the reins a little bit and allow Bruce a little bit more of an influence into the creation of these, you know, more recent Maiden albums. I don't know. I'm anxiously awaiting the new Bruce solo album because, again, I think, his solo catalog is so strong with him at the, you know, him and Roy Z kind of doing everything. It's just like a winning formula there. So yeah, I, I, I don't really have an issue with this one either. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Next up, James Labrie in dream theater. All right. So 
James joins the band with their second album, Images and Words, still to this day their biggest album. Uh, but it's kind of odd in a band where pretty much all the members write that the singer barely writes at all. Uh, he has contributed some songs here and there throughout the catalog, um, but not on a consistent basis. It's, you know, there's a few albums where it's maybe one or two tracks, some albums with none at all, other albums just one. You know, maybe I've always kind of thought that uh, because Labrie was not a founding member, he's not a New York guy, right? He's a Canadian. And I've always kind of felt that there was like a little disconnect there. You know, you got Petrucci and My Young and Portnoy early on and Kevin Moore. Kevin Moore was a big lyric writer in the band until he left after the uh, Awake album. And now, you know, replaced by Jordan Rudess, well, originally by Derek Shrini, and then Jordan Rudess. And jo Rudess doesn't believe right any of the lyrics either but in more recent times petrucci has become like the main lyricist in the band him and portnoy actually were uh, up until mike left so you know now that mike is back in the band you have to wonder how that shift is going to work once again and will james's songs kind of get forced out again or will this become more of a collaborative thing because he's proven that especially early on like on albums like uh, falling into infinity you know he's got a couple writing uh, contributions here but a song like anna lee you know it's much much more of a pop song right don't really want to hear that in dream theater uh but he would write co-write a song or two on a lot of these really progressive and heavy albums uh, sometimes it'd be a little bit more of a detour into lighter stuff. Other times it would work out fine. I think some of like the mid period albums, his contributions just kind of coincided with everybody else. But, you know, back on these more recent albums, he's, he's, he's back to like maybe doing a track or whatever on an album. And personally, I, I'd like to see more contributions from him because I think one of the criticisms that some fans have of dream theater in more recent times is that their music has gotten a little predictable and it's like you really kind of know exactly what to expect because you've got petrucci writing the bulk of the lyrics and most of the arrangements are petrucci mayung and um and rudas and so going forward i, I think it might be interesting because you're going to have portnoy back into the mix again after a lot of years away and i think that james's lyrics and his uh, way of uh, putting together arrangements as evident on his solo albums, I think varies enough from the Dream Theater formula. And I think they could use that little injection of something a little bit different. So I'm at like about a five on this because I wish he would contribute just a little bit more. And again, a little bit more could mean a steady two songs on an album, right? But I think when you have no Labrie at all, you can kind of feel it. Like I kind of know when the albums that are really controlled by Petrucci and the ones that it's more of a collaborative effort. So yeah, I'd love to see, I, I, for me, it's a five on this. I'd like to see a little bit more from James Labrie going forward. All right. Uh, I'll go eight on this one uh, because just generally, I mean, my examples happen to be ones where it doesn't bother me that much, but generally speaking, this whole thing bothers me. I just don't like it. Right. It's uh, I've, I've drawn the analogy before of like, uh, you know, uh, Tom Brady doing a doing an inter interview at the sidelines saying I'll be playing the part of uh, Aaron Rodgers uh, today for the Green Bay but, you know that hey I, I muddled it up that time but I mean but generally the idea of um, of the whole uh, you know you literally are not doing you know you're you're singing um, it it should be your thoughts kind of thing it it that it's always kind of bothered me but uh, like I mean okay, a perfect so example of that Martin just to, before we not to derail the conversation yeah. uh like the album that I really don't like in their catalog which is the astonishing that big bloated concept record you know he didn't write anything on that album and that's a double album right and I remember seeing him on that tour and quite frankly he looked as bored as I felt in the audience for that yeah. reason, yeah. because he had there's no investment for him. And maybe, you know, I, I just have, you know, that was a storyline that Petrucci really wanted to do that whole mm -hmm. concept. And you have to wonder what was going through the mind of Labrie sitting there thinking, God, I have no interest in singing this stuff. Right. I just yeah. can't put my feet, hands around it, feet on it. I just can't grasp it at all. And yeah, it's like for once I would like to see within a dream theater context stuff that he has personal investment in more so yeah. than he's had so far. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, you you would think it would be hard. You you would 
think you could see it on the face of the performer up there for two hours, whether he wrote the lyrics or not. And, and it, and it might show a fair bit if you're perceptive yeah. to see that sort of thing. All right. Uh, my next example is kiss. Um, kiss is kind of an interesting one where um, number one, you don't, you don't think the lyrics are, are great literature anyways. And it's, it's kind of like uh, a lot of the songs are about the same sorts of things and it's pretty simple and light. And so you, you're not, you're not staring at those lyrics with a magnifying glass anyways. Um, but what I like about this band is sometimes one, one will write a song and someone else will sing. They got four great singers in the band. Right. And, uh, and essentially, but what happens when, and early on, you've got Steve Cornell and, you know, weird little things like, uh, People will submit songs, you know, in the pre song doctor days. I mean, the theme here that I'm going to talk about is song doctors, but in the, in the pre days early on, you'd have Kim Fowley stuff in there. We knew Bob Ezrin would play around with the songs and stuff, but rock and roll over. You've got Sean Delaney. So you've got, you've got people in the camp who are, who are, you, you, you can picture them sitting down at a table and drinking a bunch of booze and, and writing these songs. So you're happy with it kind of thing. Right. And again, because the lyrics aren't such a massive feature, these songs, you don't really care sort of thing. As time goes on, you've got uh, dynasty's got Desmond child involved, Vinny Pontius. You've got, um, the producers taking a little bit of credit and you think, you know, you, you suspect they're going to have a little bit to do with lyrics. Uh, Animalize, you've got Mitch Wiseman in there, Asylum, Desmond Child's on five there, Hot in the Shade, you've got Vinnie Ponzi, Desmond Child, Bob Halligan Jr. So now we've got the classic outside songwriting song doctor thing, Michael Bolton, Holly Knight. Um, so it's kind of interesting that um, – I, I don't like that outside song doctor thing, but it's it's almost like any so they can write their own lyrics. So we like that about them uh, yeah. anyways. Um, and then early on, there's not a lot of it. It kind of picks up a little bit. And then we really get into the standard, more corporate song uh, outside song doctor thing. And that I've never liked uh, sort of thing. But again, because it's Kiss. Because it's kind of a big consortium, you know, they're all talented guys, you know, they can write their own lyrics anyways. Um, there's almost like a, um, there's almost like, uh, we haven't introduced this yet. I mean, it, we'll get into it, I guess, a little more in my last example, but there's a little bit of that where you're, you're happy that their ego isn't so large that they have to write everything or hog all the credit or even have to like be the mouthpiece of the band with the lyrics kind of thing. Right. So it, it it's like, it's like um, uh, that that sort of um, uh, goodwill, well-wishing thing that, oh, we just want to put out the greatest songs. We don't care who writes them sort of thing. Right. That yeah. that idea. Right. So it doesn't bother me much uh, with with Kiss at all, because it just seems like a big party, a big team, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of I wrote the whole thing. But Ace, why don't you sing it? Or Ace, Ace says, I, I wrote the whole thing. But why doesn't somebody else write it? It just it just uh, feels like. There's a lot of variety and um, and I never come away at the end thinking that any of those four guys or or even the guys later couldn't have written those kiss lyrics. They're they're probably not that hard to do. They could have done it and they've done it uh, themselves all through. So it's it's not a terrible thing at all on this one. I'm going to give it a um, I'm going to give it a three. Uh, no, I'm going to give it a four because I, I really don't like the the song doctor, the outside songwriter thing. That's when it really starts to bother me. Yeah, I, I would say for me, if we're talking about the early catalog with the original four, I don't have an issue with it at all. That's like a one or a two for me. And I think, you know, one of the things you mentioned, which I think is really key with the early catalog is like this variety. You've got all these guys contributing. And, and I think what's really cool is that you look at a song like God of Thunder, which was written by Paul. Normally, these guys, you know, especially Paul and Gene, if they wrote a song, they sang it. But here... Paul writes this song and thinks, I think this song would be better serviced with Gene singing it. And it's absolutely true because can you picture God of Thunder with, with Paul singing it? I can't because I think the, the, the nature of the song and what it's all about is perfect for his kind of that deeper kind of like menacing vocal style. I think it just works out for the, for the best at that point. So yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it, but yeah, the outside writer thing, eh, you know, whatever that, that was the time, I guess. Speaking of outside writers, so uh, I'm going to circle back to a band that basically up to a point had a specific lyricist who was considered sort of a member of the band, just kind of like Pai Dubois and Max Webster, right? So it's King Crimson. So you've got in the early part of the catalog, you got a guy named Greg Lake singing on the first two albums. You got uh, 
Gordon Haskell and Boz Burl each singing on an album each. You've got uh, John Wetton singing on three albums and all throughout their time in the band, uh, like on the first two albums, Court of the Crimson King and The Wake of Poseidon, you've got uh, Peter Sinfield, who was their main lyricist. He also wrote all the lyrics for Lizard and Island. All right. So here you have these singers who are trying to interpret these very esoteric artsy fartsy kind of poems right that's like and i and i think i'm okay with it because most of the time when you're listening to king crimson music you're drawn in by the music itself right this is prog rock right the lyrics are fine they're cool they're like i said they're kind of like floaty whatever uh and then of course when john wetton and bill bruford and company joined the band for these albums You've got uh, Richard Palmer James. So let's bring in another guy who Fripp knows because Robert knows all these dudes. Let's bring in another guy. It's kind of like the Pete Brown thing all over again, who can write these little poems and will form all this crazy, complicated, avant-garde music around it. Uh, and you got to give these guys, you know, and again, the one thing too, I think that doesn't bother me so much is that none of these singers hung around in this band for all that long anyway, right? So you're looking a year, two years, three years, maybe tops. So it didn't really matter. So here you got these kind of like the lyrics you would expect from King Crimson, they're little mini poems. In a lot of cases, there's not a lot of lyrics in these songs, right? There's not like there's, you know, four lines of verses and you got all these choruses. It's not that type of music at all. So due to the nature of the beast that is King Crimson, I'm totally cool with this, with these singers and these players just kind of concentrating on what they do best, right? And then, oh yeah, I got to sing a couple lines of poetry in between all this bombast and all this, you know, artsy fartsy stuff. So I'm going to give this a one. I have never minded this at all. But interestingly enough, when the band reforms in a different uh, configuration in 1980 with Adrian Ballou and everybody else, Ballou becomes the chief lyricist and the main singer so interesting how they totally flipped that that switch and went in the completely opposite direction when they reformed in 1980 yeah i'll give this one a three it doesn't bother me a lot um it's it's almost funny it's almost like um it's like robert fripp is treating this like a rule-breaking art collective and here's just another way he's going to break the rules just, just right. having these outside guys in there and stuff. So, and you have to wonder going forward: Did this bother a guy like Greg Lake or John Wetton, who obviously became big time lyricist after yeah. King Crimson? I don't yeah. know. Yeah, maybe they okay. weren't happy with it. My next example is uh, Black Sabbath. So, uh, Ozzy Osbourne here. So, I, I'm actually comparing Black Sabbath with Ozzy Osbourne. So we've got some some Aussie here early on. We've got Bob Daisley on lyrics. Later on, we've got, yeah, I mean, more Bob Daisley, but also um, Lemmy yeah, involved. Um, I like this one because of the comparison. Never really thought about it. Um, I think in Black Sabbath, I just feel like these guys grew up as kids together. As, as kids ourselves, I, I can't even remember how much we actually knew or thought that Ozzy didn't write the lyrics. It's something you learn over time kind yeah. of thing. You yeah. just assume not even to check the, like, Oh, the bass player wrote the lyrics. Right. Um, but it it's uh, so it's an interesting thing where uh, you learn that over time and, and yes, it somewhat bothers you, but it just feels like there's such a tight gang that um, I, I feel like um I, I I feel like that there's there's just a mind meld going on between them all anyways. And and uh, and so Geezer's writing these lyrics that just fit this this weird Black Sabbath philosophy. And as we learn about Ozzy's personality over time, it it's almost like um, it's almost like Geezer shaped his personality or they had personalities that were in parallel anyways about this fear of war and fear of, uh, you know, environmental degradation, all this stuff, because because that's one one place where you really see the humanity of Ozzy is when he talks about stuff like that, about being scared about what's happening in the world. Right. Um, so it it does make sense that he is singing these lyrics and, and it feels like it's part of Ozzy's um, Ozzy's personality. But yeah, I, I don't really have a problem with it in Sabbath because it just feels like such a collective, such a gang. It's just those four guys across those uh, those eight albums. As we move into the Ozzy Osbourne band, it bothers me more um, because number one, 
we eventually learn all the dirty laundry between Bob Daisley and, you know, all the lawsuits and everything. And Bob's writing this stuff and he's writing these great lyrics and everything. But what bothers me also is, uh, and so Ozzy and Sharon are being protective of those credits or trying to, trying to hog um, maybe uh, a little bit more of the credit and not, and not have that word go out there. So, you know, that part of the story, but also what's a little more bothersome is the name on the tin is now Ozzy Osbourne. Right. And he's not writing any more of the lyrics than he did in the previous thing where it was a, a gang. Right. So you got this guy just just by the name of the band taking a way more credit. And uh, and it's it, it feels like uh, or it's framed as a solo act. And there's like bang, 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 eight or ten songs coming, coming, coming. And you're seeing Ozzy stand up there and sing all these lyrics. And then and then it it is bothersome to me somewhat that he's not the lyricist in the band and then and then later on we get a lot of song doctors um like i say we get the four with four songs with lemmy on no more tears a lot of bob daisley in and out of the band so i'm gonna go with uh, a, a four in black sabbath and an eight uh in the aussie solo situation yeah i'm gonna give it a three in sabbath and yeah eight or nine easy in the solo stuff i never understood why he didn't just want to kind of run with that uh, once he went solo and he just continued to rely on other people to, to to pump this stuff out. It's kind of baffling when you think about it. But he's Ozzy, right? We love him anyway. Yep. Love him anyway. Yep. All right, let's uh, move on to Uriah Heap here. So David Byron and I guess John Lawton will throw him into this mix as well. So, of course, the starting with uh, the third album, Look at Yourself, is when Ken Hensley, the keyboard player and sometime guitar player, uh, became the dominant writing force in the band with uh, Very Heavy, Very Humble, and Salisbury. You basically had a mix of Mick Box and Ken Hensley and David Byron and whoever else. You know, there was a very collaborative effort on the first two albums. But then starting with this album and then certainly moving into uh, Demons and Wizard and The Magician's Birthday and every album up until Conquest. You basically had Ken Hensley writing all the lyrics and much of the music. So you've got this very charismatic front man in David Byron, who, other than maybe a song or two here and there, really wasn't contributing much. And you can't really say, you can't argue a winning formula, right? So these three albums, I don't think anybody would argue that these three albums are probably the best three albums in their catalog or, you know, one of the top three. Um, but my issue here is that when... Obviously, maybe the creativity was starting to wane a little bit. So you're looking at albums like High and Mighty, and not that these are terrible albums. And then John Lawton comes into the band. You got some excellent albums like Firefly and Innocent Victim, and you know, and then, although that's kind of spotty, and then um, a couple other albums with Byron still singing lead. Obviously, there's something there's slipping there, right? The, the creativity is not quite there. Whatever it might be, is uh, Hensley running through a dry spell? I don't know. But you've got this singer in David Byron specifically, who everybody loves. Now, he's the guy who sang all the greatest songs in the catalog, and he's just not contributing at all. And you would think that he would maybe want to step up a little bit when it's obvious that Hensley is either coming up with a different vision of what the band would sound like. And I could probably place this on Mick Box a little bit too, because they're, they were, they started to move away from that winning formula early on. And Byron is just not being that guy. And, you know, it's history shows that he had a uh, really bad drinking problem throughout a good chunk of this decade. So did they trust him to do this? Did they, did he not want to, is he not capable? I don't really know, but I, to me, it personally always really bothered me that Byron never contributed much to this band and to me this is an easy eight on this because I, I think that he deserved to be one of those great singers of the 70s and I think if he would have been the guy who was also a part-time at least lyricist and took some of the workload off of Hensley I think this band might have continued with stronger albums going forward if he was really capable of that if you go and listen to some of the David Byron solo stuff maybe he really wasn't that guy Right. Because none of that stuff is overly memorable. And maybe it was just always meant to be that a guy like Ken Hensley needed to be the driving force behind this band. But I just see like the band slipping a little bit throughout the mid and late 70s. And I you just have to wonder, could someone have stepped up in there and done a little bit more? And I think Byron could have and should have been that guy. So, yeah, I'm going to give him an eight. Nice. Uh, I'm going to give it a seven because first off, 
I don't remember even knowing or thinking about it very much. I just kind of assumed that that he was. So all all of my major years loving those Byron albums uh, to begin with, I had I didn't really even suspect, right? And I didn't know, uh, you know, how incredibly outsized. Ken Hensley's role was um, but again you've got uh, all these different guys in the band and then and then you're like distracted by John Wetton singing a song here and there all that all that kind of yeah. stuff going on um, so it didn't bother me that much uh, with with Heap and then it was again of course short-lived and I love the first half and not so much the, the second half. Um, and Lawton too right. I mean when Lawton was in Lucifer's Friend he co-wrote or wrote a lot of the lyrics in that band so it's just weird that he would come over to Heap and just basically just sing whatever Hensley throws at him. So it's kind of strange. Yeah. Yeah. All right. My last example is blue oyster cult. This is a very complicated example. Um, I won't go on too long about it, but it's a little bit similar to the Max Webster example. And it's even a little bit uh, similar to the party of people. We all know example that you get with kiss, but what I like about this one, and this is one that's never, never bothered me because number one, um, Okay, so let's let's talk about those those singers. So they've got all these great literary buddies, um, John Shirley in later life, but Richard Meltzer earlier, Sandy Perlman working on the Imaginos type lyrics. You've got Patty Smith is in there, Helen Wheels. So you've got you've got two versions of Patty Smith there. You've got Helen Wheels as as sort of the the later version of this great great uh you know kind of poet they're all kind of poets right um and then richie castellano recently writing more uh karen bouchard along the way uh you know albert's uh, albert's wife david roeder another buddy of theirs who could write songs uh jim carroll um you know basketball diaries guys so they had all this great all these great bohemian new york artist type people who were all involved sort of thing um so like of riches here when it comes to uh, lyrics. Uh, what do we use? What do we match up with? Uh, whatever type of music it was just so creative. And, and, you know, Blue Oyster Cult literary canon is just one of the great literary canons uh, in all of rock. But the other neat thing is that Donald could write a song completely on his own. And that's great. Eric could write. All these guys could write it. Albert, uh, Joe, they, they could all write uh, if they wanted to kind of thing. Um, and uh, I, I just think that... Um, this is a this is a great case of uh, of everybody working together to make great art and uh, nobody's ego getting bent out of shape that I have to write the song sort of thing. They're smart enough to realize that they've got access to really remarkable lyricists and we're going to use them. We could do it ourselves, but this is just way better. I'm going to include it in this song. And plus, we're writing the music anyways kind of thing. Uh, so that's a great thing about the whole Blue Oyster Cult situation. So this one I'm going to give... Uh, I'm going to give this one, let's go all the way to one on this one, be, simply because the results speak for themselves. It's just one of the great literary canons. By the way, uh, I said three lyricists are my favorite of all time. Captain V farts one, Blue Oyster Cult's the other. And earlier on, we talked about Pai, Pai Dubois. He's, he's my other one that I always say. So I'm going to one on Blue Oyster Cult. Yeah, I can't really argue with that because I think uh, history shows that it just works. You got every guy in the band can write, and they do. You got these outside writers that they can count on, album after album after album, that help them deliver uh, exactly what they do. It's like you, you can't argue with success. It just works. It works. And I think yeah. you know maybe later on you see uh, a little bit less of that big collaborative effort. But I think in all those '70s albums and even a couple of those early '80 albums, it, it just it just works. It works. Yeah. Good choice. Yeah. All right, my last one today is uh, Journey. You're Arnold. cutting out for me, Pete, a little bit. Are you cutting out at your end or is that my end? I don't know. Is that my How's speaker sound? going? Okay. okay. All right. Well, we'll try to get to the end. Okay. okay. Journey. Steve, uh, Steve O'Gary and Arnell Pineda, who's now been front in the band since 2007. It's like, Jesus, long time. Uh, yeah. I mean, so the history of this band, obviously early on, everybody was writing. Steve Perry joins the band. He becomes one of the main lyricists in the band, starting with the Infinity album. Uh, he would I've lost you, Pete. Yeah. Oh, now you're back again. I don't okay. know. Maybe it's weird. Hang on. Let me just check it. I'm going to check my connection back. Keep going. Okay. So uh, when Steve Perry joins the band, he becomes one of the main lyricists alongside Neil Sean and Greg Raleigh. Greg Lally leaves the band. Jonathan Kane comes over from the babies. And they become the kind of like trio of the main songwriters in this band. And when Steve Perry leaves, uh, they replace him with Steve O'Gary. 
he doesn't really write much lyrics at this point in time jonathan kane and neil sean basically becomes kind of their band uh after a little time spent with steve o'gary they hire this guy from the philippines arnel pineda basically why do they hire him you know they have a short stint with jeff scott soto who is a good lyric writer but for whatever reason, I guess his voice didn't really feel the profile of what uh, the band wanted. Obviously, they want someone who sounds like Steve Perry that can mimic the Steve Perry songs. So they bring in Arnold Pineda. He doesn't write anything. They release uh, a trio of albums so far with Arnell. He doesn't write anything. It's basically uh, Jonathan Cain and Neil Sean writing all the lyrics. You got Narada Michael Walden helps them out on this particular album, although he doesn't stick around the band long enough. And for me, this like seems like a missed opportunity. And I get it that you've hired a guy to be your front man because he can do a style similar to the beloved guy who's no longer in the band. And maybe because English is not his first language, it's his second language, right? I get maybe there's that that barrier there. Or maybe it's that Mr. Kane and Mr. Sean, who now don't even write together anymore, uh, because that's kind of like a strained relationship there. They want such tight controls of this band. They want to dictate exactly how the band's going to sound at all times. That's from a music perspective. That's from a lyrics perspective. Uh, has it made some of the latter period Journey albums pretty formulaic? Yeah, it still sounds like Journey. Right. Still great songs, great melodies. You got that voice that kind of sounds familiar. He's a little bit different and whatnot. But, you know, in the end, I always wind up thinking, are you just a really good replacement singer who can sing like the old guy and that's it? I kind of want him to do more. Is that ever going to happen? Probably not. I really don't think that Jonathan and Neil at this point want him, allowed him to be that person. So I'm going to give this a seven. Uh, Cause I always wanted Arnell to be that guy. I mean, he's been front in the band since 2007 for crying out loud, you know, allow the guy to step up and maybe write some songs here and there. But I feel like Neil and uh, Jonathan have kind of marginalized him a little bit. And I think in the eyes of the fan base, especially those who are critical of this era in journey, because he's not that kind of dynamic singer and writing force that Steve Perry was, he will never be taken seriously like a Steve Perry will. Yeah, I'll I'll give this one an eight. I mean, it just drives me crazy when I, I see bands go through these long, drawn out, uh, you know, audition processes over years and stuff to, to get a guy in a band. I'm not saying this is what happened with Journey, but I mean, just it 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 drives me nuts when I see you've got a hundred choices and you pick a guy who doesn't write lyrics, right? It just it's like, what are you thinking? It's like, do you not look at that person and go, well, you're obviously not intellectually curious or, or like worse. You look at them and go, you're kind of like 30 percent of an interesting person. You know, it's like, what are you going to be like on the bus uh, if uh, if you just don't even care to write lyrics? Right. I mean, how how much of a conversationalist can you be sort of like I, I always wonder about that. And I, I always look down on these lead singers that, that don't write their own lyrics. To, but to you have to wonder extent. how much of that is on the band, though. Do they not care? Do they only want a guy who can sound like Steve Perry? No, that's that's another. Yeah, thing. you're right. And that's bad on the band, too. You're right. That's a great point. It's, it's like, well, I guess you're not very talented in your hiring process to think or you don't really care. Right. Yeah. Or yeah, yeah, it's, it's just because if the it, band it, is thinking if the band has it in their head, that's like, well, we can we can without Steve Perry, we can write songs that sound like Journey. We can do we can write every, anything that he used to do as good or better. And we'll hire a guy that we won't have any issue with. We'll put him on a little salary. He sound, he can sing all those old songs and sound like Steve. Problem solved, right? And we don't have to worry about bickering over whose songs are going to get put on albums, whatever. We'll write the songs. You just show up and you sing them and sound yeah, like we yeah. want you to sound. Is that what's going on here? Exactly. And it means that you're less uh, in it for the right reasons. You're less of an artist because the artist in you would be super excited to uh, have more art in the band rather than just the same amount. So here's the strange thing, right? In saying all that. So they hook up with Narada Michael Walden, who is a famous jazz and fusion funk drummer uh, and songwriter. And they bring him on into the band for this album. So now essentially, you know, he he's our new drummer and he co-writes everything on here. So if you're Arnel Pineda, is that kind of like a slap in the face? I'm the front man for this band. And you're bringing in a legendary drummer and he's writing a good chunk of the lyrics and, and the arrangements. And then he yeah. doesn't even last in the band. Before you know it, he's gone. So basically, this could have been another album that RNL could have some participation in, and he's got nothing. 
And the guy they brought in to, to do the bulk of it, he's not even in the band anymore. So it's very bizarre. Very bizarre. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Anyway, here we go. Another hour plus with Pardo and Pop Off on this Friday morning. It's amazing how we get fired up about some of these, these yeah. topics, right? You get like halfway through, you're like, oh, yeah. man. So, Martin, uh, get us caught up on what's going on your end with uh, books, contrarians, podcast. What's uh, what's happening uh, in the near future over there? Well, the big book thing right now is the uh, this just came out a week ago or so now, the follow up to Flaming Telepaths, Perfect Water. So, this uh, packing up a lot of these these days. So, martinpopoff.com for that. That's the whole elaborate, you know, uh, flying off on a tangent about the whole Sandy Perlman Imagino story. Uh, but yeah, I've got the audio podcast, History in Five Songs with Martin Popoff every week. And uh, The Contrarians is our video show. And uh, we've a lot of different things go on, but we have fallen into a definite pattern of doing an album cover show every Wednesday night live at seven, seven o'clock. It's sure. always fun. There's so many albums to look at, right? So many album yep. covers. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Grant did a great job on Hudson Valley Squares the other night. Yeah. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. That that was pretty cool. <laughs> Oof, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy show. For those who are watching this and have not seen uh, the Hudson Valley Squares album war from Monday night, you need to go back and watch it. One, it's one of one of those been one of those kind of controversial shows where a lot of crazy heated discussion happened about some controversial bands and things and opinions and uh, people are watching it left and right. So uh, that happens every now and then. And I would never understand why some videos just blow up and others don't. Well, this is one of those ones that just blew up. I didn't expect it. And this happens. So and it was a cool show because we had like half regulars and half guest stars martin was on there as well and i pulled in a bunch of folks from from different shows because uh, a lot of the hudson valley squares uh, folks couldn't make it and it just it turned out to be lots of fun and uh it was fresh and different so yeah anyway uh let's see coming up here on the channel we got ken golden coming in uh, in just a couple hours we will be uh, going through the professor's picks new releases today here on this friday tomorrow we've got the uk connection fun show so simon Stephen, and i decided to go and look back on the year 2010 and specifically look at what our top 10 albums were for that year that we posted uh, and published on the webzine. And then look back and say, is that how we would rank our top 10 from 2020? I mean, 2010, if we were to do it today, very interesting show when you go back and look at what you rated very highly 13 odd years ago. And now today you're kind of like, geez, I've got something sitting at number eight that I don't think I've even listened to past 2011, right? And going back and looking at that. So very, very interesting ep uh, episode and, and uh, ex uh, exercise to go through. So that's coming up tomorrow. And then Sunday, speaking of Grant Arthur, he's coming back. We're going to be ranking the albums of Player, the very cool California soft rock, yacht rock, hard rock, pop band from the uh, mid late seventies into the early eighties. They've got six albums. We're going to rank them. So that's coming up. If you know the song baby come back, that's the band, but they had a lot of other really good songs and some pretty cool albums. So uh, if that's the only song, you know, watch this, watch this show and learn a little bit about their albums. So till then, this is on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on YouTube all together all the damn time. Please subscribe if you haven't already and click on that notification bell so you get alerted of all of our content as a post. And please do hit the like button before you leave. For Martin Popo, Fine P. Pardo, enjoy your weekend. See you back next week here on the Fun House. Till then, have a good one, everybody. Bye.